back here. Um, on the test tomorrow, there is going to be 15 questions. Of those 15 questions, only two are multiple choice. The rest are all free response. And those two multiple choice questions are going to be sometimes, always, or nevers. So those are your multiple choice answers. So it's either gonna be a sometimes, always, or never. The rest of the questions are all, you know, either naming something or a number answer, a calculation. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look. Now, just like on the quiz, you need to remember to include the appropriate symbol with the correct points, um, depending on what they ask you to name. So for the first question, it wanted another name for plain M. Remember, when you have a capital letter or an uppercase letter with no point next to it, that is the name of the plane. So that picture down there, that would be plain M. Another way to name a plane is listing three non-collinear points that are in that blue section. So my example here would have been plain X, Y, N. Now, you could list those points in any order, it wouldn't matter. What's important is you include the word plain in front because if you just put X, Y, N, I don't know if you're talking about points, I don't know if you're talking about a triangle, so you need to include the description. Um, you could have done that in any order as well, but you couldn't use point P. Then for number two, when you're naming a line that's in that plane, remember you can name a line with a lowercase letter, and that's what we did here with the letter G. Okay, this is a lowercase letter. There is no point next to it. All that lowercase g is doing is naming that line. Remember, you can also name a line with two letters. So a line that would be in the plane using two letters, you could say it's x, y, and remember to include the picture of the line on top. You could have also said y, z. You could have also said x, z. Pick two points on this line in that blue section, and that would be a line in that plane. Now, if you give me X and the lowercase g like this, this is wrong. G is not a point, okay? Also remember, these right here, you could also technically say line X, Y. Um, but moving forward, it's going to be easier to use the symbols versus having to write the letter, uh, the word, because we're going to be going into proofs and your proofs will get kind of wordy. All right, for the next one, the line intersecting the plane, and that is this line going straight down through here. So again, notice there is a lowercase letter here, so you can call this line H, which is what I had here. Or again, you could have used the two points that were on the line and PY, but you need to include the picture of the line on top. For the rays that are in this picture, again, two points, no lowercase letters, with a picture of a ray on top. So my samples here were XZ, you could have done YX, you could have done YP, just pick a starting point and then point it in the direction. Opposite rays form a straight angle or a straight line. So in this particular picture here, your opposite rays would have been from Y to X and then from Y to Z. Notice the Y's, the endpoint is the same. They have to share a common endpoint. If they ask you to give opposite rays in this one, a pair of opposite rays could have been from C to A and from C to B. The first letter in each ray must be the same. And again, they'll form a line, but they point in opposite directions. Yes? For the uh, pair of opposite rays, mm -hmm. um, could I put, um, actually, it works. Okay. All right, then the 
The last one, name a point not in plane M, and that was this point P up at the top. All right, everybody good on the naming? Again, use the symbols. Yes? Uh, for number four in our plane, could I put um, for the rays, YZ and YP? Yep. And just make sure you have the arrow on top. Perfect. Yep, you can. Wait, okay, so a ray is like the one that has like a point and then the line, right? Mm hmm and honestly, you could put it in any direction because all of these that were on here, all of the, these are these two right here, these are lines going this way and this way. So really you can pick any two points on these lines and make them into a ray. Okay, so like you could have started, like she said, you could start at P and go to Y or in this case, you could also do YP. No, because H isn't a point. Because it's the line. It's the line, yes. Wait, but then, but then, isn't, isn't like PY like the line? So, depending on the symbol in, on top. So, if you say PY with that, then we're talking about the segment. But if I do PY with the ray on top, then what this means is I start at P and then I go in that direction. So technically you could also call line H, you can also call it line PY. What makes it a line is the picture on top. Everybody good? So the, the process of naming these different things, we're gonna use this all year long. So right now we laid the foundation of what we're using all year in this section 1-1. Everybody good? Yeah. All right, one, two. This is where we talked about measuring and constructing segments. We also saw our segment addition postulate. So again, up here at the top before they start the problems, they go over some topics that were covered. If you happen to look and read the textbook, section two was pages 18 through 11. So now down here is where we had the practice problems. So remember our segment addition postulate basically tells you if they give you the measure of two of the smaller pieces of the entire segment, all you do is take each of the smaller ones, add them together, and it'll give you the measurement of the whole thing. So here to find the length of the whole thing, which was XZ, you just had to add 17 plus 24. Or if they give you the measurement of the entire thing, and then they ask you to find this little piece XZ, then you would do subtraction. And again, you're doing this without a calculator tomorrow. Then the next one, if they ask you to plot the points in a coordinate plane, you're gonna plot them tomorrow, and then you're gonna determine if the segments are congruent. Now, if after you graph them, like I did here, and you connect them, because they wanted you to test out, is AB congruent to CD? So I'm gonna take AB and connect this, Remember, when it's a horizontal line, you don't have to do the distance formula. You don't have to subtract. You could just count the little squares. So this has two, three, four. This has a length of five. Same thing for CD. You can count one, two, three, four. Notice four is not equal to five. So that's why you would say that AB is not congruent to CD. Yes. I'm gonna give you a coordinate plane, just like in the warm up, but with no numbers. Okay, so um, so for example, I'll show you what I'm gonna give you. Um, correct. Yep. So I'm gonna give you a coordinate plane that's gonna look like that. That's what I'm gonna give you and you'll have to add the numbers yourself. Okay. All right, now, um, 
I may give you coordinates that are gonna form a triangle or a rectangle. And then I'm gonna ask you to find the perimeter and the, and the area, but we're gonna see that coming up. All right, everybody good on section 1.2? All right, let's go on to 1.3. This is where we learned about using the distance and the midpoint formulas. So up here is an example of how they calculated the midpoint. Over here is an example of how they used the distance formula. Now, let's say this was the answer we got when we did the distance formula. Remember, we're not using a calculator tomorrow. So instead, if you get it to 45, we need to leave this in simplest radical form. So we need to do the factor tree. Now, if you're good at recognizing that nine was a perfect square, you could just square root it, but I'll show you keep breaking it down till it's prime. Then we look for a pair. I've got a pair of threes. That makes a perfect square, bring it out of the radical. The five doesn't have a pair, leave it underneath. So that would be the square root of 45 in simplest radical form. Now, tomorrow you're gonna be given questions where they're gonna give you both endpoints. For example, like 10 and 11. So if they give you two endpoints, let me do number 10. And the, segment, uh, the points where S was negative two, four, and T was three, nine. So to calculate the midpoint, this is the formula we use. We add the X's, divide it by two, and that'll give me the X of the midpoint. To find the Y of the midpoint, add the two Y's, divide by two, and you get the Y of the midpoint. Now what I like to do is give labels to my order pairs. So this I'm gonna call is my order pair number one, my X1, Y1, and this is my order pair number two, my X2, Y2. I'm now gonna plug those four numbers into the formula I just wrote down. So I'm gonna go ahead and for the X's, I'm gonna add those. So negative two plus three, divide by two. Negative two plus three is one, divide by two. Remember, this gives me the X of the midpoint. What I did was I grabbed each of the X's and that's what I put right here. Now I'm gonna do the same thing for the Y's. I'm gonna go ahead and add the two Y's. Use, I'll do blue and then plug them in here and here. So I'm gonna take four plus nine and divide by two, 13 over two. Gives me the Y of the midpoint. Remember your midpoint is in order pair. So one half and then 13 comma two. I'm okay with you leaving it improper. If you want to change it to a mixed number or a decimal, you could do that as well. This would give me six and a half. Or if you made it a decimal, it would be 0 0.5 and 6.5. I will accept either one of these tomorrow. This question also asks you to calculate the distance between those two points. So we also need to memorize the distance formula for tomorrow. So using the same two order pairs, I'm going to take my distance formula, x sub two minus x sub one squared, subtract the y's, square it, and this is all under the square root. So now instead of adding the x's, I subtract. So three minus negative two squared, and then nine minus four squared, and this now becomes three plus two, so five squared. Over here, nine minus four is also five, and then square them, add them, and now do a factor tree. Factors of 50, you could do five and 10, I'm gonna do 25 and two. And then if you keep breaking it down till it's prime, Got a pair of fives, five comes out. So five square root two is the distance between those that order pair S and T. 
Another way that they'll say simplest radical form is they're gonna say, leave your answer exact. When you see that terminology, it also means simplest radical form. So be able to recognize both ways of representing the answer. Everybody good on midpoint and distance? So let's say instead at the 50, you thought 10 times five or five times 10. It doesn't matter the order because we're gonna still break it down till it's prime. 10 is not prime, so I need to change this into two times five. This one I still need to bring down. Once that bottom row is all prime numbers, now you go back and look for pairs. So when you have a pair, if you think about it, five times five is 25, and the square root of 25 is five. So you don't necessarily have to go back and multiply it, just know that when you make a pair, you just take the number out of the square root and write it down one time. Anything else that doesn't pair up goes back underneath the square root. Okay, so for example, question number 12, I think. Yes, 12. I'm going to do number 12. So for number 12, the they gave me the midpoint of JK, and they gave me the midpoint. It was the ordered pair six comma three. Then they gave me, so the segment was JK. They gave me N point J, and that's the ordered pair four nine. They want me to find N point K. So I am using this formula that I've written right here. K, I'm gonna say is my x2, y2. My j, this is my x1, y1. The midpoint is my x of the midpoint and my y of the midpoint. So I'm gonna take these four numbers and I'm plugging it into this formula. So I'm gonna go ahead and place the x1, which was the four. I don't know x2, and I know the x of the midpoint is six. This is where your algebra skills come in. You're gonna go ahead and multiply both sides by two to get rid of the fraction. And now you're left with solving four plus x sub two equals 12 and then you're gonna subtract four, and the x of your endpoint k so far is gonna be eight. So, so far we've got the first answer or first part of our answer. Now we have to do the same thing for the y. So now, okay, I wrote down the wrong order pair. If the order pair was four, nine, that would have been the right answer. So this should be 14 comma nine. So let me fix this, 14, 14. So the correct answer here is not eight, it's gonna be a negative two. All right, so the correct answer for this question, so far we have negative two. And now I gotta do the same thing for the Y. So I'm gonna take my y1, which is nine. I don't know the y2, and I'm taking the y of the midpoint, which is three. I need to get rid of the fraction. So I'm gonna multiply both sides by two. And now I have nine plus y sub two equals six. And now I subtract nine. And the y of my endpoint is negative three. So the answer here is negative two, negative three. And that's order pair k. Okay, the next one, number 13 here, they're telling us that m is the midpoint of ab. So if I draw segment ab here and put m in the middle, Remember, a midpoint splits 
the segment into two equal pieces. So they gave me AM, which is from here to here, and that's going to be 3X plus 8. Then they also gave me MB, which is this, and it's 6X minus 4. Remember, these two pieces, AM and MB, are equal. So in order to find the length of the whole segment, I am going to set these two expressions equal to each other. 3X plus 8 equals 6X minus 4. And now I need to find the value of X and then plug it in. So I'm going to go ahead and start my solving process. Subtract 6. Negative 3X plus 8 equals negative 4. Subtract 8. Negative 3X equals negative 12. Divide by negative 3. And X equals positive 4. Now, it did not say to find X. It wants AB. And remember, AB is found by adding AM plus MB. And that'll give me a, B. So remember, A, M was 3X plus 8. So I'm going to plug in 4. 12 plus 8 is 20. And then I'm going to do the same thing for M, B. M, B was 6X minus 4. Now, if you remember, these were equal. So once I plug in 4, if I don't get 20 for the purple, like I got 20 for the red, then I've done something wrong. So this gives me 24 minus 4, and I get 20. So the length of AB is 40. Now, if the question would have said find AM, then you just plug it in to the 3x plus 8. So read the question carefully of what I'm looking for you to get. Next section was perimeter and area in the coordinate plane. So I am going to be giving you some order pairs to graph. And I'm telling you right now, it's going to be a triangle. So I'm going to go ahead and do number 15 for you um, because that's what you're going to see. Um, the example here was a rectangle. So let me go ahead and do number 15 because this will be similar to what you will see tomorrow. Let me go ahead and add in a coordinate plane. So you will be given a graph just like this, and you'll be given three order pairs. I am going to ask you to calculate both the perimeter and the area. You need to know the formula for area of a triangle, and that is one half base times height. So I'm going to graph E, which is positive six, negative two. Then I'm going to graph F which is positive six, positive five. And then I'm gonna graph G, which is negative one, five. I'm gonna connect my points to create my triangle. Remember, when the sides of your figure are horizontal lines or vertical, you can count the squares. You can also do the distance formula but either the x's or the y's will cancel. So for this one, let me go ahead and put in my segments here. This was g, this one was f, and then e. So I'm going to count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. This segment is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Now, coincidentally enough, there's 7 and 7. Um, it's an isosceles triangle, but you don't need to know that yet. However, for GE or EG, you can't count the squares. You must do the distance formula. So my order pair E is six, negative two. My order pair for G is negative one, five. I'm plugging it into the distance formula. Subtract the X's, square them. Subtract the Y's, square them, and it's under the square root. So negative seven squared 
This becomes five plus two, so seven squared. 49 plus 49 gives me 98. I need to break this down. So the square root of 98, I could divide it by two, and it's 49 times two. I'll break 49 down into seven and seven. I'm now at prime numbers. I got a pair of sevens. The seven comes out, the two stays underneath. So the length of this side is seven square root two. Yes? So EG would be the base? EG, no. The base is actually gonna be the horizontal line. It'll be GF. Okay. But I need to find the perimeter. Remember perimeter, we add them all up. So I'm gonna do seven plus seven plus seven square root two. The only thing I can do is add like things, so I can only add the constants. So this perimeter is going to be 14 plus seven square root two. Now I need to find the area. The area is this formula. This is going to be my base. The base and the height are always going to be a horizontal and a vertical line. They're always perpendicular, and that word's coming up soon. So this is gonna be the right angle. So this is my base, this is my height. So 1 half, seven times seven, gives me 49 over two. I'm okay with you leaving it like that. This would be square units, or you can divide it 24 and a half, or 24.5, and again, square units, yes. So you can divide, and two will go into 49 two times, subtract, bring down, two goes into nine four times, and I get eight. Now, if you were making it a mixed number, you take the whole number, take the remainder, and the remainder goes to the rooftop, but if you were making it a decimal, you're gonna add a decimal point and add a zero and then bring it down. And then two goes into 10 five times. So that was one four and now one five. This is where we learned about measuring and constructing angles. Again, I'm not gonna make you use a protractor, but you do need to understand the angle addition postulate so for example, on number 16 here, they're giving us the measure of the entire angle ABC. And they're telling us that ABC, this whole thing, measures 77. So in order to find this little angle here, ABD, and then try to find the one right next to it, DBC or CBD is what they're asking us to find there. Let me see if I can use a different color here. All right, so this one is here and then this one is blue. I'm gonna use my angle addition postulate. So what I need to do is add angle ABD. So I'm gonna add ABD's expression which is 3x plus 22. I'm gonna add that to CBD's expression. So angle CBD, which is 5x minus 17. And remember, the whole thing equals 77. So I'm gonna combine my like terms. I'm gonna add three and five, so three X plus five X is eight X, and then I'm gonna add 22 and the negative 17 or 22 minus 17, that gives me five. And then now I can go ahead and solve my equation by subtracting five, and I get eight X equals 72, divide by eight, and x equals nine. Remember, it didn't ask for x. It wants me to find angle ABD, which was three x plus 22. I'm gonna plug in nine. I'm gonna multiply 
and add, and I get 49 degrees. Then for CBD, that one was 5x minus 17. Now remember, these are not congruent angles. It wasn't bisected. So I'm going to get different measures. I'm going to multiply. 5 times 9 is 45. And then minus 17 is 28. Remember, these two added together should equal 77. If they don't, you've done something wrong. 17 is exactly the same thing. They're giving us the whole measure, so we will add the two expressions and set it equal to 111. Then in section 1-6, this is where we learned about the special angle pairs. So you need to understand that complementary angles are two angles that when you add them, they equal 90. Supplementary angles are two angles when you add them, they add up to be 180. Also, understand the vocabulary term adjacent, which means next to, and also understand the vocabulary term vertical. Now, remember, this review doesn't cover everything. Your job is to go back, review your warm-ups, review your homework, review your notes. This is just some of the content that's on there. There is still the other content that they didn't give us examples of, like vertical or adjacent, things like that. However, to find um, a measure when two angles are complementary, if they give you the measure of one of them, as long as you understand that complementary, mean the angles add up to be 90, take the angle they give you, subtract it from 90, and that's how they get the 78. And for number 21, where they told you that they were supplementary, you would take the angle that they gave you, the 116, and this one gets subtracted from 180, and you get 64. So understand the vocabulary terms so you understand what type of calculations you're doing. So this is the review. Again, a good place to start. You now have the additional review that you can complete. You have your warm-ups that we did yesterday and the warm-ups from the beginning of the year. You also have your quiz that you can use to review. And again, I had been giving you even problems for homework. So any skill that you feel you're lacking on, go back, use your e-textbook and get the odd questions and you can do some additional practice that way. So your homework tonight is to study. You do not need to submit anything to Canvas.